rhyme with all the diseases you've been here before. You have <laughs> Lithuanian name. It's a common ending. Uh, uh, I, uh, I'm a professor uh, emeritus. That means uh, that uh, the university has recognized me, but I'm retired, as you can see very happily, uh, with my sunglasses and shades. And, but being emeritus um, also means that I'm allowed uh, to still do work uh, in my lab. The university is still giving me a lab. And I, I'm trying to finish up some things that I started, hopefully, with a good ending. Uh, I've been involved in research for uh, more than 40 years. I started here at MSU in 1989, coming from the Scripps Clinic and Research Foundation, where I spent 10 years establishing a couple of programs uh, that study uh, the molecular basis of the inflammatory responses of certain white blood cells called neutrophils. And that's what I'm going to try to convey to you today, tell you a little bit about neutrophils, how they might uh, relate to um, inflammatory bowel disease. So with that, Let's uh, start, and I've got to get used to having all these screens in front of me here. Okay, so if you look at a recent New England Journal of Medicine, 2009, it defines inflammatory bowel disease as an inappropriate inflammatory response to intestinal microbes in genetically susceptible individuals. And this... Uh, this definition or this description of the, disease, of, the uh, of this state actually allows me to present uh, just a very brief summary of uh, how research has been organized uh, in this uh, particular area. So uh, I feel very fortunate that after me, my colleague Seth Walk over there, who's also at uh, Montana State, he's not emeritus but he's also now retired, so he's actually uh, continuing his work. And he will tell you about uh, uh, the GI biome. He's doing a lot of very interesting work on uh, how microbes of the uh, gastrointestinal tract figure in your health. Uh, and tell you something about the hygiene hypothesis, uh, we're going to have to use the old school methods here. Identifying now, see, I can't, I can't figure out which side I should go to, but the hygiene hypothesis, which you've heard a little bit about, and Healman for worm therapy, which you've also heard about, which you offer great promise. Uh, the other aspect of inflammatory bowel disease is this genetic component, genetic susceptibility. And um, I don't really do any of this, but over the last years with all the omics that are being done in genomics and the identification of different genes and then the identification of variations in those genes. There's been an amazing amount of work that's been done to be able to correlate what, how those variations figure into various diseases. And three groups of genes have been identified that are associated with uh, processes that uh, uh, result or that give the susceptibility to um, uh, for inflammatory bowel disease, including uh, certain genes. Of course, immunologists always and geneticists always pick the hardest words to pronounce and the most difficult way to abbreviate them. So nobody can remember them, and you have to sit and study them for days. I'm not going to really get into this, but as I, suffice it to say that these groups of genes. Uh, are now figure very importantly, and we do have we have identified brought genes, their processes, and how we can study them uh, to uh, to really get at the bottom <coughs> of these genetic susceptibilities. My particular area is would be the inappropriate inflammation, and that involves the immunology that you've heard from uh, about uh, heard about from Dr. Shaneyfeld uh, and. Uh, where the immune system interacts with uh, the blood cells uh, to, in fact, result in these uh, activation events 
Uh, and what's the, the net result from all this, from, from the therapy point of view, has been the identification using computational drug design. So the kinds of things that I do is I look and try to find what molecules are involved in a particular process, you get the structure of those molecules, and from the structure you can actually try to figure out what can fit into this molecule to make it not work right, and sort of uh, adjust how these various processes and various pathways uh, take place. There's the targeted immunotherapy that you heard about, uh, and we developed probes using much of the same methods that uh, now are used to develop um, therapeutics uh, that affect individually identified uh, components of uh, the immune response and the inflammatory response. And then finally, uh, mitigation of this inflammatory response uh, by the development of drugs and these therapies to uh, really affect the uh, autoimmunity. In fact, that's that's taking place uh, when these processes happen in IBD. So, one interesting uh, slide, looking on the web, preparing for this uh, kind of talk, from the standpoint of autoimmunity, IBD is in fact related to a number of different conditions that now are grouped into this autoimmune system. And what I've, what I've done here is circle a Renicade as a target for TNF. This is, uh, I mean, a uh, therapy for the TNF target, which controls TNF, the, this cytokine that you heard about earlier. And if you can see that there are different pathways that identify other points of common uh, function that really uh, impact uh, IBD. So learning about IBD, we also learn about uh, these other autoimmune uh, diseases. And all of them represent in their final uh, phases some sort of inflammation that takes place. So <clears throat> in terms of the white blood cells that uh, I've been studying, this is a sort of this impossibly complex uh, network that exists between individual cytokines that are produced by a variety of cells. Now what's a cytokine? It's a protein molecule that's produced by cells that then is used as a messenger to tell other cells what to do or tell itself what to do. So they they, in fact, are produced by immune cells, body cells, and tell uh, the various cells uh, whether uh, what the state is around them. So they're kind of chemical messengers for immune cells. So <clears throat> many of these messengers signal inflammation. We talked about inflammation, but what is this inflammation? Well, for 2,000 years, we've known that inflammation involves redness, heat, swelling, pain, and ultimate loss of function. If you look it up on Wikipedia, this is the image that you get. It's a, it's a, a condition called chillblains, where exposure of the extremities to cold results in an inflammatory response, and you get swelling, redness, uh, heat, and pain. Now for the pathologist, for someone who's studying the cells uh, in the body, uh, inflammation means uh, something else, and it involves looking for a certain kind of blood cell called a uh, neutrophil or polymorphonuclear leukocyte. Now, all of you have seen these cells. All of you have been at high school biology, and, and you've all seen blood smears, and this is the most abundant white blood cell uh, in the blood. And it is an amazing cell that's basically used as a sentinel uh, to look for uh, points of infection and damage within the body. So in the blood, when it's circulating around, it just looks like golf balls, like many of the other uh, white blood cells, in contrast to the red cells, 
that you see here. There are about 5,000 of these per cubic millimeter uh, of blood. Now, in the, in the blood uh, system, in the vasculature, the way the, the white cells are carried around <coughs> are by the blood flow. And if, you, if I had a movie of this, and I saw some beautiful movies last week of this process, I kind of wish I had them. But uh, all the red cells would be flowing by here really fast. You could hardly even see them. And carried along with them are most of the white cells. But then, if you look at, along the edge of the vasculature, along the uh, vessels, you see these cells actually rolling. Okay, they're rolling along. And these are the uh, lymphocytes and uh, the neutrophils rolling along trying to find places where they should do their business. And they come up across an area of inflammation where there's a bacterial infection or where there's like a, what you could call a sterile infection. You hit your hand with a hammer and you cause damage. There's no infection there, but the neutrophils know it. And they find these sites of damage or infection by spreading out on the vasculature, and then crawling through in between these cells, they're called endothelial cells, through the tissue cells, and eventually uh, arriving at the bacterial or damaged site. Okay, now this is a protective response of neutrophils, protecting us from, and I'll switch over here for a little while, for an infection that can be bacterial or fungal, <coughs> It results in immune activation and also injury, as I said, so a sterile, uh, kind of a sterile injury that results from trauma from oxygen starvation. So what are some examples of this? So if you take a mouse and you inject fungal spores, aspergillus, bread mold spores, into the mouse's lung and wait a little while and assay the, the fluid that might accumulate there, you will see these enormous aggregates of neutrophils. They're primarily neutrophils. And in the middle of these are all these little fungal spores that are, are basically out of commission. The mice just, just take this as a matter of stride, even though you've thrown billions of, of uh, uh, canidia into these uh, fungi. If you have an immune-compromised mouse, and this mouse is genetically deficient in one of the post-defensive processes that the white, uh, white blood cell, the neutrophil, uses. The neutrophil is capable of making uh, something called superoxide, which then is converted to hydrogen peroxide, which then is converted to bleach of all things. And that bleach is one of the agents that's used to kill these fungi and prevent this from ever happening. Because these particular mice are deficient in that they don't have the molecule that's needed to make that bleach. So what happens is you get these aggregates, now they can't do anything. All right. Now in a sterile injury, and a good case of that is a heart attack, let's say, you'll have uninvaded tissue and invaded tissue. This is tissue that's invaded with these neutrophils. Each of these black dots in here is a neutrophil and they're accumulating these massive numbers because they've been signaled to go there by the damage induced by the <coughs> oxygen starvation of the heart. And so uh, when they accumulate they unleash their, uh, their uh, microbicidal potential. That is they start making superoxide, they start making hydrogen peroxide, myeloperoxidase, all kinds of oxidants. They're full of bags of little enzymes that degrade all the material that your cells have made of. So they're extremely damaging. And, uh, and that's where the inflammatory damage actually arises from in a heart attack. You lose some function from actual cells that were oxygen starved. But if you deplete mice of their uh, neutrophils or rabbits or other animals and you and you give them this artificial heart attack the, the damage is actually minimized. So the neutrophils, the white blood cells are the ones that are contributing in a major way to the damage. And the same thing 
uh, is going on uh, in your gut. So remember that, uh, and this is a schematic of uh, the gastrointestinal, uh, let's say the small intestine where you have microvilli that are uh, highly vascularized, that is blood vessels going through, and they have this very thin layer right here, okay, of epithelial cells along each of these villi. But that's a very tight layer, tight, not allowing any of the bacterial products to get through. Uh, this this um, environment here is just tightly packed with bacterial uh, bacteria. We know, for instance, and it's been quantitated, that certain bacterial products that we know activate the neutrophils uh, are here in concentrations that are enormous and would activate these cells. But uh, when everything's uh, functioning properly, uh, the neutrophils just don't know it. And they'll just flow along uh, through the blood cells. However, if, if there's a break, if there's some trauma, if there are, uh, is an um, inappropriate production of the cytokines that you've heard about earlier, that will cause the neutrophils to stick to the vessels and migrate through and result in uh, these kinds of uh, uh, cysts and abscesses where they accumulate in enormous numbers, releasing all their products, causing all this damage to your uh, gastrointestinal tract. And this is basically the primary damaging process that's going to be occurring in inflammatory bowel disease. And ultimately, you get to the point where the, the abscesses uh, get so big that they're even visible. Uh, naked eye is this, as you can see, like the pus and, and lacerations in, uh, in the gut, uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, so let, let's hope that this works now. So to study these cells in the laboratory, we use little pieces of bacteria called f net They're pieces of protein. And what happens is we can uh, have a little region that's embedded with this f net And these are all neutrophils. And what's happening is the, the f net leaches out, and uh, these little um, amoebae, which are neutrophils, are accumulating at this site. So the same thing would happen if we pack bacteria here or if we pack dead cells here and broke them up with a laser or smash them in some way, the neutrophils would accumulate and start to uh, be activated. And one of the activation uh, that occurs uh, occurs here, you can see this beautifully, as this neutrophil approaches a fungal cell and starts wrapping uh, it's pseudopods around this and engulfing this cell. And what you see all this red stuff here, that's the accumulation of a dye called nitroglutetrazoleum, which represents the generation of this hydrogen peroxide and, and, and uh, hypochlorous acid or bleach. And this is what kills uh, bacteria. So we study both of these processes. We study the the ability of the neutrophils to to uh, study uh, to um, uh, detect the sap that we feed, and we also study this process of superoxide production. We purified components of these white cells that uh, are responsible for both of these processes. So I'm going to talk about the bacterial sniffing response uh, that the neutrophils have. This is what. Uh, f met is it's the N-terminus of these protein molecules, three amino acids, and it's very potent, activates neutrophils directly by a specialized protein called the receptor, and it's released by bacteria during an infection or when they break, and it's also released by cells. So where is it coming from cells? Cells don't make f met Bacteria make it. Well, it turns out that a component of cells, mitochondria, is evolutionarily related to bacteria. Okay? And they still make 
formulated methionyl proteins, which FNET and B would represent. And the neutrophils actually recognize that as a signal for damage. And so there you there they've evolved to recognize uh, bacteria, but they also recognize dead cells. This is my old dog uh, uh, Chester or Newfoundland, and he has this amazing nose with a giant head uh, that uh, can recognize amazing, amazing uh, food in any corner, anywhere in the house. <laughs> so, so they, <coughs> the dogs are able to sniff uh, various odorants um, using cells. In fact that have FNET Luffy receptors too. There's odorant receptors for FNET Luffy in the nose. And the sniffing, uh, I call this the sniffing response of the neutrophil because it's able to detect bacterial fragments in broken body cells. This is a three-dimensional view, a model actually, that, uh, that we made of one of these receptor molecules. And it sits in the membrane of neutrophils. This would be the outside of the cell, and this is the inside of the cell. In my work, you know, I can't go into the individual things, but we've identified where in this molecule this FNET Luffy binds in here. We've identified what other molecules interact with this receptor and where it interacts and how it interacts with those molecules. The structure of these has not been determined to, uh, to chemical preciseness with crystallography, but now many receptors, they have the same kind of structure and we can model them. Did you have a question? Neutrophils have the ability to uh, eradicate bacteria intra intracellularly? Intracellular. They engulf the bacteria and they digest them. Most bacteria. Like Pac Man. Yeah. Most bacteria. And they so it's not just the outside of the cell, they do actually go into the cell. They don't go into the cell, they eat the cell. Oh, they take okay. it inside and digest it and kill it. So they're they're little amoebae that find a bacteria and they're about maybe 10 times the size of a bacterium in, in uh, volume probably. And they're, they're actually capable of, of getting several at once and uh, ingesting it and killing it. Now that, that doesn't happen with all bacteria, but many of them. And there's a big process that's involved with so-called opsonizing the bacteria, allowing them to be recognized by and bound by the neutrophil very, uh, so that they are activated as well. So this whole business, and this is what, this is a thing you can, can pick up on the web. It shows you sort of a schematic, very inaccurate schematic. Um, I like it because it, it has a pretty picture of our receptor right here with the FMET Luffy on this side and interacting with intracellular proteins and then this complex array of pathways that has uh, multiple effects that include activation of uh, uh, inflammatory pathways for release of uh, cytokines and activation of the superoxide generating system. Lots of different uh, things that are activated <coughs> by the neutrophil. So our work in uh, the most recent days involved trying to see if we could detect the state of these receptors when they're actually in uh, a lesion that we uh, uh, have been able to isolate from humans having inflammatory bowel disease. And we use a, uh, some, a process called immunofluorescence where we've made synthetic uh, laboratory made antibodies. There are little protein molecules that we can tag with fluorescent probes and when you shine laser light on them, they light, uh, they light up in a green color. And uh, it turns out, so in this picture is a schematic that I showed before of the microvilli in your intestine. And if, if you make a cut right here, right here perpendicular 
to these structures called crypts, uh, you can then look at them face on, looking down. And that's what this next slide is. Uh, this is uh, normal human, human colonic mucosa. And you can see the crypts here. And what's interesting, and this is a discovery that we made with collaborators, that they, these crypt cells, in fact, have the same receptor I just talked about that's on neutrophils. We didn't know that uh, maybe five or 10 years ago. We didn't know that. This is a new discovery. And now these receptors are found in different places, including nose cells. Uh, but they exist here, and they, they promote the healing of wounds. So if you have a wound in your gut, the receptors here recognize bacterial products, and they close up more quickly. Uh, also, when we looked for neutrophils, which is what this, this uh, money for this work came from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, we found in patients, biopsy or actual surgical resection patients who have ulcerative colitis, in this case it was a mild ulcerative colitis, we found neutrophils surrounding these crypts. And now notice two things. One, you could, normally there are no neutrophils here. There weren't in the one before. And also notice that these epithelial cells are not being lit up anymore. So they're formal peptide receptors are not recognizable in this case, they're not being expressed, and they're accumulating these neutrophils. In this area, it's called the lamina propria, the, the tissue surrounding the crypts. At high mag, here are the neutrophils. You, know, you never find them in crypts in a healthy person. But here in this uh, Crohn's disease patient, you find them uh, getting through into the, the crypt. Yeah? Steve? Yeah, so you're saying that basically a normal villi like they have these uh, surface receptors for more normal primary questions that will help to identify whether bacteria is present. Then when the neutrophils move in, those villi, if they need close to cells, lose that surface. They lose that expression of uh, uh, FDR. Of, uh, so therefore, if the white blood cells aren't going to go and destroy the mucosal um, cells, is that correct? Uh, no, well, the mucosal cells are operating as an independent system. The white cells invade the crypts and start doing their business. They start killing everything in sight. They start releasing superoxide, their, their degradative enzymes. And what, are, what we notice here, that the receptors in the mucosal Mucosal cells somehow disappear. So why? We don't know. I mean, they're <laughs> uh, and the neutrophils are here now. And this is just really a first shot picture. No one's ever seen these cells or this receptor in this kind of uh, situation. But the implication is that mucosa is damaged. It's damaged, just not going to be able to heal itself. Right. Right. And uh, the, the experiments that were done in model system where you took uh, a layer of cells, a uh, certain kind of cells, and you made a mechanical scar in it, separated the cells, killed everything in between. Normally, that would slowly grow together. If you throw a method B in there, the, this little bacterial peptide, they start growing together four or five times faster. So the idea is that in, in normal recovery from injury, these cells are going to increase their uh, their recovery rates. But in this damaged uh, situation, uh, uh, they probably are not doing that. You're saying the neutrophils are not helping. The neutrophils are are not helping. The neutrophils are responding to all of a sudden the flood of bacterial products that are coming through the the epithelial tight junctions and, and broken epithelium. And ultimately, they start piling up on one another uh, and form these, um, these aggregates, much like the ones I showed you in uh, the lung uh, surrounding the, the fungi. Here they're, they're forming these aggregates and, and sort of the take-home message from that particular study, and it's coming out in the next month, 
in the journal of Psych Biology is that we have a way of protecting the unactive state and the active state of this formal peptide receptor. And we found that in these aggregates, everybody really considered this kind of a, a, the residual of dead neutrophils and dead cells that accumulate into this pussy uh, abscess. But uh, our finding, and it needs to be confirmed, is that the cells on the surface, the neutrophils on the surface here, still have active receptor that's not been shut off and may still be uh, contributing to the activation of more cells coming in there and propagating the inflammation. So, uh, so that's kind of a view of, of the small amount of research that we've done. You have to consider that there are many receptors in the neutrophil that uh, stimulate similar processes. There are receptors for all the cytokines. All of these things are acting at once. Uh, and there's this incredibly complex network that has to be sort of figured out. And really, I mean, I'm at the end of my career. I'm not ever going to figure this stuff out, but somebody with some really good computer skills will be able to come in doing uh, these omics studies uh, to be able to identify how we can get a handle on this disease by attacking a specific um, a component somewhere, some magic bullet, maybe like you know, like Infliximab or the Remicade that, that I spoke about before with the TNF. So in any case, I, I thought I'd give you uh, an idea. It's, it leads to um, other questions that we have uh, about this, but ultimately, uh, it just requires hard work getting in there and a bunch of people uh, studying this stuff. So I wanted to, again, thank Kathy. And money, too, right? And money, <laughs> right. Money. And that's why I want to thank Crohn's and Colitis Foundation for this work. National Institutes of Health. I, I'm bragging, but I have the, uh, I, I hold the record at NSU for the longest running NIH grant. Uh, <laughs> I renew them every five years, so I had a, a good run. And then Montana State for giving me my, my lab and giving me the opportunity to do this work. And also the clinical lab at, at uh, Bozeman Deacon is, is that over the years they provided us with uh, fresh human normal blood uh, that we studied neutrophils with. And many students, colleagues, and collaborators here in Montana and all over the place. So thanks very much. Thank you.